Hello. Hi there. Who's this? Uh, this is Dan Monahan. Excellent. Welcome. We're going to give everybody just a couple of minutes to wrap up all the work they're still doing and uh, join us. So maybe till five past. Okay. I'm um I'm on my way home, so I'll be on my phone, and then I'll I'll get on the um on the video thing um to go to meeting. Perfect. Well, thanks for joining us. I think that's just fine, and hopefully um, we don't have a ton of visuals. We have a lot of links. Good. Is this Megan? Yes. Oh, Megan. <laughs> My God. No. Okay, they only give it. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe it's one, maybe. Uh. All right, we'll give it another two minutes here. To everybody who's on, thank you for joining us. I know that everybody has a, a million things to do in addition to normal things like wrapping up your clinical work and dinner uh, around this time of the evening. But <laughs> it's a complex year and a little bit of a dense committee in terms of uh, the subject matter. So I, I do think it makes sense to follow the lead of the coding people who have the densest subject matter of any of the committees and be a little bit more formal about onboarding let everybody meet each other and uh, uh, have an opportunity both to ask some questions if you've got them and to meet the people who will answer your questions, uh, namely primarily Jill and Mo, but certainly also myself and Dr. Leiden. One thing I can say is that uh, I was new to this committee last year, and Megan and and Mo and Jill did a really great job, you know, getting us onboarded. And it becomes less and less scary as time goes on. But the first time you're on this committee, it'll overwhelm. It's not at least it did to me. Excellent. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Mo, do you want to start by kind of calling the roll of the? The roster and we can go around with the folks who are on the call and everybody can introduce themselves again and let us know where you are. I'm Megan Tracy. I'm at the University of Virginia. I was on the old Health Policy Committee uh, and have been on uh, government relations for a while. I'm an MDJD and uh, worked on the Hill for a while in the, on the Senate side, so don't any house type people take it that. Um, and I've always had an interest in policy in that I think that that federal legislative regulatory policy have a real potential to help us meet our mission, you know, what we're trying to do for our patients all the time, but also if they're not done well and we don't have a real voice, um, the potential to really hinder our ability to do what we need to be doing. So appreciate all of your volunteering, all of your effort and um, your evening tonight. So do we want to go around and see who's on? We've got about 10 people on it looks like. Um, yeah. The vice chair want to start, Dr. Lydon? Yes, yeah, so I'm Sean Lydon. I'm the chair of vascular surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I had been on the PAC committee for many years. I started on the government relations committee last year, and uh, and I've always had a sort of interest in in the healthcare of medicine and both the economic side as well as the advocacy side. And so uh, I've actually really enjoyed this committee over the last year and was uh, honored to ask to. Uh, help vice chair it this year and so I've got the big shoes to fill as Megan let me help out some so she's done an awesome job. Dr. Wooster? Well, 
Uh, sure. Hi, this is uh, Matthew Worcester. I'm a vascular surgeon at Meadow University of South Carolina. Uh, this is, I guess, starting my second year on this committee. Uh, pretty similar. I, I've got a particularly large amount of involvement, unfortunately, as I'm sort of in my third year practice and still getting my feet under me. But uh, it's good to be part of sort of just a conversation and be able to know what's going on so that I can bring that back to my institution and uh, make sure people are aware of what sort of changes are coming ahead. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Ryan? Hey, I just joined. Uh, am I supposed to say who I am and what I'm Yeah, who you are and, and what you're doing. What else you're doing for the SVS? Because I think there are a number of people on who wear a lot of hats for the SVS, and this cross-fertilization uh, is really very helpful. Uh, hey, well, it's nice to see you, Megan. Um, I'm Patrick Ryan. I'm a uh, private practice currently probably not for long, solo practice surgeon in Nashville, Tennessee. I recently, like yesterday, rolled off the Quality Measures and Performance Committee. And um, I actually asked to be put on this committee um, because of its mandate and because of its, because I'm a big uh, follower of Megan Tracy. I've always been a big fan. And I want to learn a lot. Um, and so I'm here to learn and help in any way I can. I'm also involved with a new, we're coming up with a new community practice division or right. something in the SVS that I'm helping uh, get started. So yeah, that's it's helpful to make sure that all types of practice are represented here. Um, Dr. Dusa? Director Mohan, whoever can unmute first. Uh, hi. Good evening. Nick, do you Hello. want to tell us who you tell everybody who you yeah. are and um, what else you're doing for the SBS? Background here. Obviously, you you uh, work on the uh, college side as well in the policy yeah. arena. Yes. Uh, so my name is Nick. Um, I work uh, up in Michigan, just north of Detroit. Uh, I uh, been doing stuff with the SVS. I was a previous uh, 2018 SVS uh, Health Policy Scholar uh, with the combined ACS SVS uh, program at Brandeis, and um, I'm very interested in health policy. I have an MPH focus on health policy, and uh, I'm still in the OR right now. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. That's a typical day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Dusan, did you want to speak to the group? Hi, my name is Sarah Dusan. I am uh, currently an assistant professor of surgery at the University of Maryland. I'm uh, starting my fourth year of practice in August. Um, I was, now that I'm settled in practice more, I'm interested in playing a bigger role in SVS and being more involved. And so um, this is why I decided to join the committee. And I was interested in this committee because I'm just interested in. Um, government policy and how that affects us and how we can shape uh, what happens to our organization um, to vascular surgeons. So I was very interested in being a part of this committee. Well, thank you. And in normal times, we'll practically be neighbors. Welcome. Um, who have we got on the phone? Hi, this is Paul Demisio. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm the chief at uh, Jefferson and uh, brand new to the committee. Looking forward to uh, participating and learning as much as I can and uh, much appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here and learn this. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Who else have we got on the phone? Hey, it's Pete Rossi from uh, Milwaukee. I just dialed in. Excellent, thank you for joining us. I think we've got three more. Um, I mean, this is Jill Rapp, and I'm just looking at the roster and seeing. Okay. Who else okay. we have? And we can circle back, and if anyone didn't have an opportunity to introduce themselves, we can give folks another opportunity at the end. Megan, I can go ahead and give my little story. Of course. Sure. Uh, this is Dan Monahan. Um, I'm in private practice. All I do is treat veins, and I'm 
a liaison for the um, American Venus Forum, um, previously the chair of the Health Policy Committee for the ABF, and um, met Megan at one of our meetings and uh, very impressed with um, what she and the SES are doing in terms of advocacy uh, that have left us in the dust. So we are hoping to hang on to your coattails and uh, gradually um, learn how to advocate for uh, the well, interests of our physicians and our patients. We're going to be great partners this year, particularly now that we have your correct email address. So <laughs> this year, <laughs> there'll be more traffic than last year. Yeah, I was Thank supposed you. to be a member last year, but <laughs> Thank you for being patient with that one. Anyone else on who wants to share with us before we get started? All right. Well, let me start out by saying, you know, what was it? About three years ago now, um, the committees were realigned somewhat. The old health policy committee really uh, folded back into the council and, and some of its subcommittees were broken out. And it'd be nice to just walk through a charge, particularly because as we dusted off the original charge of this committee, there were still things on there like the certification of vascular technologists that I think are not our top priorities this year. So really, I just wanted to walk through what we're presenting to the uh, executive board as our goals for this year and what we think the scope of our work is. And uh, this is what we're going to be doing in collaboration with our partner committees. So we're going to work with the other committees on policy advocacy and advocacy council and with leadership to develop SBS positions on both legislative and regulatory issues that impact vascular surgeons and their patients. And that's where I think a lot of the cross fertilization and the representation we have on this committee is critically important because it brings issues that impact uh, the Venus practices, issues that impact private practices, OPL. Uh, academic groups, um, areas, you know, urban, non-urban, differently affected by the current situation to the table to make sure that we're doing a good job covering all that. We're going to engage in advocacy efforts on issues of importance uh, through education of SBS members, only 5% of whom said that they could clearly explain the current Medicare, upcoming Medicare cuts. It's a separate topic and a little bit disturbing, but that, that a little bit of that is going to be on all of our shoulders public messaging and engagement of both legislators and regulators. We'll work with the PAC uh, steering committee to strengthen SBS uh, efforts and grassroots advocacy using tools like voter voice and the new social media ambassadors campaign. Thank you immensely for those of you who already volunteered to be social media ambassadors uh, and who got your first set of marching orders from Mo today. Uh, and we're really also working uh, as a force multiplier, because we remain a small group, even when we're a bigger group, uh, to develop what's called a grass tops presence, really building relationships with key policymakers, um, in-person engagement, virtual engagement, meeting your legislators, developing relationships with your legislators and their staff, particularly in key areas. Uh, and among the materials for the call today in that zip file, you can see really the key committees that we're dealing with where those people's districts are. Some of you live in their districts, and these are gonna become really important relationships. Uh, we're gonna monitor and anticipate important developments in healthcare reform. Uh, what we'll talk about today, uh, obviously, is Medicare physician payment reform. Some of that will be really proactive stuff, looking at the implications and impact of policies, um, similar to the, to the collaborative work that some of the people on this group did with the Alternative Payment Model Task Force. Um, ultimately, depending on what happens in November, we may have another round of very significant healthcare reform in this country, the likes of which we probably haven't talked about the prospect of in over a decade. So that's going to be a, an important role of this committee as those things start to develop. We'll support advocacy messaging through the use of SBS platforms. Um, that has exploded in the last year. The SBS has provided absolutely unprecedented support for messaging among our group uh, in the best timing ever, because a lot of you have used that as COVID has, has rolled out um, to, to do a lot of messaging around clinical care and best practices, et cetera. So we have the vascular web, we have SVS Connect, we have the specialists, the pulse, 
a DC update, which is just restarting following a, following a pause around uh, the initial part of COVID. Letters to membership, and thank you also for the members of this committee who have volunteered to uh, tag team with the PAC uh, steering committee to send letters to membership. And all of this ongoing work to leverage the impact of this messaging through uh, coordinated social media campaigns. We'll participate with other council committees um, in the analysis of the proposed rules and developing formal comments representing the SPS. So this notice and comment thing, which we'll talk a little bit of it about and uh, looking over the regulatory process. Um, and then we'll continue to build the resources available to our members on the vascular web uh, and work with staff on the content. And again, this year has been absolutely amazing in terms of bringing on board a terrific staff and having just lightning fast turnaround in terms of getting things posted on the vascular web and, and making adjustments based on based on feedback of that. So that's a committee charge. Um, Jill, would you like it to walk us through the legislative process and the regulatory process? I actually found a great CRS, the, the CRS overview for this, and, and we may be able to link to it, but um, we can talk just a little bit about not only the the schoolhouse rock how a bill becomes a law aspect of the process, but also where our touch points are in that process. So Jill, do you want to talk through that a little bit? Sure. So we have a couple of different links here and also some attachments in the zip file um, for you to help sort of re re remind you what you probably learned in high school history or government class um, many moons ago in regards to how the legislative process works. But in general, um, yes, this is a very easy one. In general, and this is what I think people maybe don't totally understand, is that many times the ideas for a piece of legislation come from external constituents. Most members of Congress don't think up their own pieces of legislation unless they already have a personal interest in something or a personal family connection. So most of the, of the ideas come from outside groups just like SVS. So uh, one of our touch points or one of our jobs is to really help Congress with ideas for how the healthcare system can be better, right? And actually help them form that idea into a piece of legislation that would be able to be implemented. So some of the things we've talked to them about and brought ideas are around prior authorization relief, are around things like wellness. We'd like to talk to them more about that actually. The idea years ago of AAA screening and the Medicare should cover that, that it would save lives. Um, other sorts of that the ultrasound uh, tests had gotten clocked by CMS and needed some relief. Not everything needs to be done by a piece of legislation. Um, that process is long and arduous now in a way it never used to be. Many times it can be Congress helping us out with the administration through letters, phone calls, and other sorts of things. But but everything starts with an idea, and a lot of the idea comes from us. So that's a that's a major touch point. The other touch point is after something is actually introduced, that second bullet there. And that's because bills only move if they have a lot of co-sponsors, and particularly co-sponsors from committees that, um, in our case, um, the Ways and Means, the Energy and Commerce in the House, or the Finance or the Health Committee in the Senate, um, those members are co-sponsors. So that's another big touch point. That's where grassroots comes into play. Um, that's where voter voice, our resources, where all of you your partners, your colleagues, your patients in play. It's helping to get members of Congress to co-sponsor a piece of legislation. And this is where particularly the, the vast majority of stuff dies. It just goes and sits. So you've moved the ball a little bit by getting something introduced, but it has to go somewhere. That's right. That's right. There's over 4,000 bills of Congress that are introduced, and maybe 100 of those actually get enacted over a two-year period of time. So it's so you can introduce a bill for the sake of introducing a bill, but it's really it's about how how you move that bill through the process. And both the House and the Senate require regular order, which means the legislation has to go to the committee. It has to have a hearing, has to then have a legislative hearing if it's in the House, and then it um, can be marked up, go out of the committee, and then and then off to the calendar to have the leadership decide whether they'll let it come to the House or Senate floor. Do you want so, to talk about um, so you, if you're actually going to get it done, it has to go to the committee. So markup is when the committee gets together. Yeah, it's called markup. Actually, we have a little document 
in your attachment that's a, a kind of an acronym sheet or a definition sheet, but we call it a markup. But basically, it's the committee getting together under the notice that they will um, vote on pieces of legislation out of the committee. And, and we say markup because they can change the bills during that meeting by amendment um, to the bills. And so that it can be, quote, marked up, right? Literally written through and decided whether it will move forward. So that's why we call it markup. But it's basically a meeting of the committee for which it has been referred because of its jurisdiction. Different committees have different jurisdictions. Yeah. Things so that you like can, can be put into the, a bill at markup. Things that you don't like can be taken out. Things that you don't want can be mm -hmm. slid into it at markup. Uh, it can basically come out looking to almost totally different. Yes, that is true. And so, so then the bill comes out of committee. It doesn't guarantee it'll get a spot on the House or the Senate floor. Um, and but many times committees won't won't vote out bills that, that the leadership won't take up. So when you're trying to get a bill done, you have to basically tell the committee staff, the leadership staff, that the leadership will schedule it to go on the floor. Or they're not going to waste their time. So, but usually by the time you get to the floor of the House or the Senate for an actual vote. Um, you know the bill is going to pass or you know the bill is going to fail and basically if the bill is going to fail it's not going to get a, a vote on the floor anyway in this current environment um, unless it's an amendment um, and they want it to fail and they just want to get it out of people's system so to speak um, but that's what's, what they say when they say we're calling for the yeas and the nays that means they're calling for all members to come in and vote so that's sort of the process and then it goes to the white house for signature and then it goes to the agency for implementation and um, implementation can sometimes be more important than than the writing of the bill itself because today congress doesn't want to write pieces of legislation as specific as they used to which means there's a lot of flexibility to the agency that actually gets to implement the bill and so hhs in our case cms in our case um, may be able to define the specifics um, and so you have to work the whole process through with the administration to do whatever you're doing, get it implemented. And so that's sort of a whole secondary piece of it. And that's where medical societies like SPS get involved too. So there's lots of touch points um, in the process and um, that's where members weighing in with their members of Congress at different points will move an idea through the process to getting signed into law to being um, implemented. Many times you're trying to put something on a much bigger bill. We sometimes call those bills vehicles. Sometimes you'll call them Christmas trees. Um, but that those are the things where if you want to get something passed, you put it on a must passed quote vehicle. And the, um, those are appropriations bills, budget bills, um, COVID-19 bills in this instance. Um, the National Defense Authorization Act gets done every year. Um, so if you have something in the defense area, um, it's good to put it on there. Um, so those are some bills that have to get done every year. But otherwise, um, we don't do bills every year. So you could have a little single issue bill that will set for years um, if you can't figure out a way to get it put onto a bigger bill that's moving. So those are the sorts of strategy, excuse me, strategy pieces you have to figure out when you're running a bill through. Absolutely. And this is where, you know, our advocacy staffs being essentially on a first name basis with all the key committee staff is critically important because that's probably the, the single most important <clears throat> contact point once something is actually moving forward. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, in terms of oh, yeah. uh, feedback on how things are going. Staff, and, and they're yep, and a gatekeeper. They are the so a bunch of uh, 28 to 35 year old people you've never heard of who are incredibly powerful. So I guess we can segue into the regulatory process, which is not that different in some regards. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, with the regulatory process, what we, we care about most um, in physician land is the fee schedules. And the fee schedules, the Medicare fee schedules come out every year. Um, usually on time, but this administration has struggled with that, particularly in the last two years. We are awaiting the physician fee schedule and the outpatient hospital fee schedule. They're now about two and a half weeks late. But basically, you have a proposed rule. We get 60 days to comment on it, and then CMS issues a final rule, and that rule then goes into effect within 60 days um, with the fee schedules. 
fee schedules, it's not only the payment amounts, but it's also an opportunity for the Medicare program to do policy changes as well. All of the changes in the E&M codes. Um, so those are the, op so it's a, it's a guaranteed annual opportunity. There's an inpatient rule, a physician fee schedule rule, an outpatient rule. There's also Medicare Advantage rules um, that come out every year. And actually just today, CMS uh, sent to OMB the final rules for the um, changes this administration has wanted to make to the Stark law to create greater flexibility for alternative payment models and some anti-kickback statute flexibility again to make uh, room uh, futuristically for alternative payment models. So there may be other types of rules that aren't in the fee schedules that come out as well that we will care about. But um, but it's mostly we watch the fee schedules because we know they're going to come out every year. And um, and there's, the administration has to write the rules um, because we know when the rules are going to come out. If we have something we want to work with them on ahead of time, we can go meet with CMS or HHS staff, whoever's in charge, work with them on the getting something in the proposed rule. Some administrations, you can switch things up with them by fighting them after the proposed rule is out. This administration, that's been much harder. Um, and so uh, things have, have needed to try to get into the proposed rule because um, this administration, one, because the rules are late, and two, because they're not very uh, flexible <laughs> administration. Um, in some respects, they have certain things they really care about. Uh, we haven't seen as many changes between the proposed rule and the final rule as we've seen maybe in other administrations. So, but you can fight them during that time frame, and we definitely have, SPS definitely has over the years. Yeah, and if you look at the, the agenda, they're actually um, through the advocacy website, a portion of the website links to examples of the comments that are provided uh, by SVS every year to the proposed rules. Uh, and that gives you a little bit of a sense of the fact that this ends up being this give and take process with the um, agency staff on this front. So does anybody have any questions about either the legislative or regulatory process for Jill? She's kind of our in-house expert on that front and does really an immense amount of the heavy lifting uh, with regard to uh, navigating all of this, doing a lot of the messaging, the actual virtual, but you know, formerly in-person <laughs> meetings, um, and crafting our uh, our comments to the rules, and really just kind of walking us all through what the uh, interesting items are in the, each rule as they proposed rules they come out, and uh, often uh, the lead time to know what's coming before it actually comes out, because those turnaround periods are incredibly quick. So, yeah, you can see those. Um, as we talk about 2020, 2021 priorities, Mo, do you want to see if I am actually capable of putting my slides up? I can just knock through quickly for anyone who missed the town yeah. hall, kind of what I put together for that. And there's also a link to the Surgical Care Coalition fact sheet with regard mm -hmm. specifically to the issue of uh, budget neutrality and the Medicare cuts but I can give this a try. And if it's not working, then you've got the link and uh, I think folks can work through that. So let's see. I did this at the real time too. All right, is that coming up okay? Not yet. Not yet. What do I need to do? So you should see on the bottom a little um, button that says screen. Uh huh. And then if you click that, does that, it should allow you to share your screen? Let's see, your entire screen. No, please don't yeah. the entire screen. Um, if you go, Megan, if you like scroll your cursor down underneath everybody's names, if you're doing, there's there's like an icon that says mic, camera, screen, leave. Uh huh. Did those pop up for you? Click on screen and it should share, share your computer screen or give you the opportunity to be the presenter. All right, so let me try. There you there go. You are. All right. And I get to switch this every single time, about six times before it takes. All right, let me see. Let me go back to the beginning of this thing. Hopefully by the time this is over, we can just go back to having regular meetings and I can go back to being kind of remedial here. 
So I talked just a little bit at our town hall about the impact of the Medicare cuts, uh, the role of advocacy in the GR committee and what else we're doing this year. So obviously we're looking at this long history of essentially the devaluation of surgical services, of physician services overall, but specifically surgical services. So this is a, a Bob's Wolak point times, you know, at least 20 years. Um, if we look at the real unadjusted conversion factor in 1998, think about what you were doing in 1998. I think he used the BlackBerry, the or no, the Palm Pilot uh, as an example of what was happening in 1998. And this year, uh, it's a little bit less this year, but we're adjusted for inflation from Medicare. You'd be realizing uh, an average of $57 per RVU. That's a little bit disappointing. Uh, in 2021, and this really started two years ago and was essentially deferred for a year, there have been changes to payment for E&M services, office visit services, um, with the idea that there would be additional reimbursement, uh, really responding to pushes for primary care and family medicine in particular, um, you know, including when they made those original proposals, some of you will remember, to essentially collapse all of those outpatient visit codes. Uh, into you know essentially a single level of service. There there was also an add-on code uh, that was created essentially to help make up anticipated losses for certain specialties that were going to be hit, and it was a little bit arbitrary. In any case, um, the other thing that's happened is that to the extent that the E&M services are going to be better reimbursed, that value has not been captured or has not been included in the ENM services that are that are captured in the global package. So if you get paid for 90 days worth of services or 10 days of services around an operation, <laughs> that should reflect every service that you provide in that period of time, including ENM services, you know, your initial visit, your follow-up visits, et cetera. Well, it's not included in that, which again erodes the value of surgical services specifically. Um, and one of the biggest parts of this and why it really hits is that because of budget neutrality requirements, giving uh, more to one area within the, the House of Medicine ends up resulting in cuts across the board for other folks. So what we're talking about here, and, and if you look at this, it breaks it down a little bit more specifically, but we're really looking at six to 7% across the board cuts for vascular surgery. So why uh, is the House of Surgery uh, uniting on this front? And actually, you know, other members of the House of Medicine um, the American College of Surgeons estimated this is a $350 million impact in the first year on its own membership. So what's the big ask? We could get into the weeds of talking about how unfair it is to uh, not uh, include payment for E&M services provided within the global. We could talk about the fact that they've really violated their own requirements and methodology by, by um, adding this add-on code that makes some people's E&M services worth more, than, worth more than others. But if we have a single ask that makes for a, a decent 30-second elevator talk with legislators and others um, that will undo this and let them give their increase to primary care but hold us harmless, it's waiving budget neutrality. So that is our 30-second elevator talk, although it's certainly not the beginning and the end of the policy aspects of this. This is really the 2020-2021 the ask. So uh, in January, the Surgical Care Coalition really came together. The SVS has made a substantial investment um, in that. It's about a dozen members now, uh, along with the American College of Surgeons, um, investing in uh, modeling, investing in surveys, investing in really putting together a very sophisticated advocacy and marketing campaign around this. So there were surveys of the general public, of surgeons, and of key decision makers. So there's some news uh, from the general public. Surgeons save lives. They kind of agree. We work pretty hard. Some of them think we earn our salaries, but they don't feel super strongly about that. Um, they like us more than HHS. They like us more than insurance companies. I guess that's all good, uh, but less than uh, nurses, primary care physicians, and emergency room doctors. So you can start to see where the heavy lifting comes in. So what are the challenges? Uh, they don't like us as human beings necessarily all that much. They think we might not have the best bedside manner. We may or may not be compassionate to patients. They think we drive fancy cars. Um, they do concede that we save lives. And to some extent, they think that we've earned our salaries, but they're absolutely not worried about uh, the financial impact of COVID on us or our financial security going forward. 
Um, and many members of the public actually think that uh, surgeons, along with other physicians, have financially profited from the increased volumes uh, associated with COVID. So with regard to uh, the heavy lift I referred to earlier among our own membership, um, when they surveyed surgeons about this, uh, about a quarter of people said that they were familiar, I know, which, which was quoted as, I know about this, but not all the details of their new rule. 4% said they could explain it in detail. The remainder uh, of surgeons basically said, I've kind of heard of it or I haven't heard of it. They have absolutely no idea what this is. There's not a 30 second or a five minute or really any elevator talk. They're just concerned that it's another source of pressure. So again, the Surgical Care Coalition and its membership um, and, and really its mission going forward. So. There is a campaign, please visit the surgicalcare.org site. That link is also available. And you can see the members, you can see some of the news and media, uh, including some more sophisticated things like placing um, articles and op-eds in both uh, in traditional journalism and also in, in sort of the Hill papers, um, sort of respected policy trade publications that the people who are working on this read every day. <clears throat> and really taking that survey data and the projections of the impact and marshalling it to make a case that is tailored to what we understand the polling data to tell us, uh, both about what people don't know, what the public doesn't know, what key decision makers don't know uh, about the impact of, of these cuts. Um, and also to what sorts of arguments are going to be appealing and what sorts of arguments, frankly, turn them off. So uh, all interesting to look at. So an incredibly compressed timeline. Uh, we're looking at the rule coming out any minute, uh, literally, uh, one would hope, within the next week. Um, a period uh, for comment uh, immediately upon release of that, the final publication of the rule, and as everybody who's been involved in this process at all recalls, you know, it comes out right before the holidays start and somehow uh, everybody is supposed to retool to respond to that uh, over the holidays and before the 1st of January. So this year we obviously also have a major, major uh, potentially impact election, uh, potentially change of control in the Senate, uh, obviously in the administration, you know, potentially as well. So a very busy year for us. So here's a link to some of the news and media associated with this. So what's SVS advocacy? What's our mission look like in 2020? Uh, we'll do a lot of collaborative work, collaborative work with the Surgical Care Coalition, which I just talked about, as well as a broader surgical coalition. The SVS is also active in, in broader physician coalitions, has representation on the AMA. Um, independently, the Policy and Advocacy Council, you know, has its uh, set of committees that are all working hammer and tongs on this. Uh, leadership has been completely engaged. We've seen uh, that Dr. H Hodgson had made this a real priority, uh, particularly toward the end of the year, and that Dr. Dahlman has really taken the lead on this as well. And then we have a fabulous group of professional staff and consultants, both some new faces and some people who've really anchored our operation, you know, for over the last decade. So uh, your role as a surgeon member, there's grassroots advocacy, voter voice, uh, responding to the letters to legislators, et cetera. Um, the ability to step up as a grass top leader uh, through the ambassadors program, through uh, with the guidance of our staff um, and working hand in hand, absolutely with the PAC committee, um, developing key relationships with key lawmakers. Um, for all of you who've already done it, volunteer on a committee and spend whatever bit of your evening you weren't either working or trying to recuperate from work. Um, and supporting SBS advocacy through the PAC. Uh, we're pr currently at about 5% participation in the PAC, which uh, both leaves us with not quite the resources we might want, although we're doing you know as well as we've done, uh, even given this year. But it also is an important message to send to our legislators that it's, all, it's not a handful of members who are interested in this effort and the outcomes of this effort. They really have the membership on board. So um, grassroots activity, engaging Congress and CMS, uh, legislative calls to action, these targeted campaigns, which all a number of you have taken part in already, and uh, this grass tops outreach. So voter voice, you can share your story, you can reach out and contact your legislators, you can set up meetings, you can 
um, tell them your story, anything you can do to make, uh, the, to put a human face and to outline the impact on, of, the, of cuts and, and of any other policy decisions on the quality of care your patients uh, receive on your patients, um, on your patients access to care. I mean, when you walk it back to the 30% of practices that say they're concerned about being able to weather this at all, uh, you can tell people what that means in your own geographic area. Incredibly important. Um, social media activity, uh, appreciate those folks who are facile with that. Incredible opportunity to amplify the message and it has become crystal clear in the advocacy world that legislators are watching social media like hawks. Um, they're very interested in email coming in and people calling their offices, mm -hmm. sending letters, but um, they are absolutely watching uh, all of the social media panels. Uh, and uh, again, there are going to be more opportunities that it may be easier to work in that has historically with our schedules to visit with elected officials virtually um, or hopefully as, as things improve in various folks areas to meet with their district staff um, and to set up to meet with people in what used to be called recess, but is now referred to as the district work period when all of our legislators are back at home. So uh, again, I think we included a link to the um, Social Media Champion and Ambassador Program kits. Um, please uh, ask for help with this and guidance where this is just being launched and is a wonderful opportunity. <clears throat> and thank you all for that. This looks like it's our current breakdown. I think we have more people on Connect. I can even do that with help. So um, thank you for that. So are there other priorities in 2020 beyond these cuts? Yes, that's uh, issues one, two, and three, but we have some follow-up on coronavirus response. Uh, there was huge uptake among our community for the Paycheck Protection Program and disaster loan uh, programs. Um, there are some ongoing issues with regard to the um, repayment terms, uh, you know, in terms of interest rates, in terms of length of time for repayment, accelerated advance payment very much so, um, as that's not excused, it truly is an advance. Um, the original interest rates were uh, absurdly high and the original repayment times uh, really anticipated that this would be as prior crises have been a fairly short term event uh, and COVID is not proving to be that in terms of its impact on people's practices. So those are moving parts that have been part of letters to Congress uh, from SBS and other organizations. Uh, we'll continue to watch provider re uh, relief fund disbursements, liability protection, um, one for folks who are working outside their standard area of practice uh, in COVID, but also um, for potential suits related to delays in care or the prioritization of surgical care um, around COVID are important, have been taken up by some states, but not all, and are a part of an ask. Um, the availability and distribution of PPE and supplies and then really ongoing top priorities for SBS prior authorization, um, both around Medicare Advantage, which is existing legislation uh, where we have some real congressional champions. And uh, more recently, or over the last year, um, these local coverage determinations uh, within the Medicare program where uh, prior auth is now as of July 1st being required for uh, venous procedures in a lot of areas. So very, very important. Um, red tape reduction and burdens on practice. So everything from the EHR to, to every uh, reporting and regulatory thing that makes uh, the day in the office longer than just taking care of patients. And then we are looking at workforce issues, whether it's GME uh, debt burden or medical student debt burden, uh, the allocation of additional residency spots um, should those be created and funded? Because I think the overarching commentary is always that those should go to primary care, but there is an incredible shortage of, of uh, surgeons anticipated. And I, there was something that just came out in the latest uh, American College of Surgeons bulletin about the fact that vascular surgery, 60% of the respondents to a survey um, said that there were vascular surgery shortages in their area, which actually led among all of the subspecialties. And this is something that all of us know and feel. So that's really what we're doing this year. And thank you for that. Let me stop sharing and we can move on. Any questions about our priorities for this year? And I think we've kind of talked about the current campaign of voter voice and grassroots and all of that. Uh, anyone on the call have questions? 
And I think that you now have Jill's and Mo's contact information, my contact information, Dr. Leiden's contact information, and we're more than happy to field questions. And I think uh, the key guys have you guys have other, use Twitter It's yeah. really, really simple. I mean, you basically click on it. It finds who your Congress people are. It helps you construct an email. But the key thing that Megan put in there that Jill has taught me, anybody who's served on the PAC before, the more you personalize it, the more you put a personal story in there, the more likely are it's going to have an impact with the staffers who have no idea what we're talking about. And so if, to get to the congressman's ear, you got to get a sympathetic staffer to understand your story. And so the more you personalize it, how it affects your employees, your practice, your patients, the more impact it has. Absolutely. That and, actually, be okay. yeah. and it opens the door to their actually wanting to reach out and follow up with you sometimes uh, to hear more about this and starts to build those partnerships that transform it from, you know, one, one hit in a grassroots campaign to building of an important grass tops type relationship. Anybody else with comments or questions on, on that? Did anybody hop on? I see a couple of people who hopped on the call and didn't get to introduce themselves. I see Dr. Dua joined, um, who is another one of the, uh, the um, SVS uh, policy scholarship winners. I think that makes at least three of us on the call. I was way back in 2011 or 12, 2012, maybe. It might have been the first one. So thank you to the SVS for that. Um, do you want to tell folks who you are and where you are and uh, introduce yourself to the group? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you very much for uh, uh, having me introduce myself. My name is Amata Du. I'm um, an assistant professor at Mass General in Boston. Um, just started, uh, graduated from Stanford last year, um, and um, uh, I'm very familiar with some of the people that have been part of the committee and know Dr. Tracy from before as well. So it's a pleasure to be um, included in this group for the first time this year. Um, I have always been interested in advocacy and I know how much of an impact it makes and um, how important it is that we actually get our voices heard. And so um, I was very grateful also to the SVS to get that, that scholarship and that kind of has prompted a lot of my interest in this field, especially for us vascular surgeons. So thank you. Excellent. Anybody on the phone who didn't have an opportunity to say hello to everybody? Uh, I haven't. My name is, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hey, I'm Susan Shaffey. Um, I'm a vascular surgeon. I live in Clearwater, Florida. I re I trained at Cleveland Clinic with Dr. Leiden. Um, uh, graduated in 2013. Worked at Emory for two years in University of Minnesota for three. Recently moved home to Florida. So I'm in Senator Rubio and Rick Scott's neighborhood. But um, I actually recently got my master's in health systems administration from Georgetown. And I was around a lot of the DC uh, policy. I did my undergrad there too. And I realized that uh, policy and uh, being involved in DC is the way to get anything done. Uh, some of my professors are in the innovation center in CMS. So I have a lot of connections on that end. Um, so I can help out if you need anything from the back end if uh, needed. Excellent. Thank you so much and welcome. Um, thank you for taking your evening and for joining the group. We're good to, glad to have you. Anyone else we might have missed? Hey, um, Megan and hey. Sean, Jill and Mo, this is uh, Pete Ross. Yeah, I've been kind of off and on the call while waiting for my anesthesia colleagues. It's been quite an afternoon. Um, where, I can imagine I mean, that. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure none, nobody's ever heard of that before on this call. Um, what, uh, where are we at on the idea of prior authorization relief? I mean, this this is just such a mess for all of us, and particularly for people in private practice who just don't have enough hours in the day to sit around screwing around with these things. Um, what's our status with the involvement in that process? So that's been a long, uh, it was identified going on three years now as an absolutely top priority among a, you know, in a survey of SVS members in terms of red tape bureaucracy and, and administrative burden. Um, there is a legislative vehicle. It really does just address the Medicare Advantage right now. But Amivera and some other folks 
in Congress really are champions um, of that. And uh, Jill, did you want to talk a little bit about potential vehicles this year for that to move? There is the potential for yes. some deficit on this front. Yeah, so um, SVS actually had a, a little uh, round table with Congressman Barra with our California PAC donors and, and some of the leaders, and we're actually hoping to do more of those. So give to the PAC and maybe you'll We'll do something with member of Congress from your state. But um, that bill now has 225 co-sponsors in the House. It actually has enough co-sponsors to go to the floor without going to the committee. But um, they, but Congressman Barra has an agreement with the committee, as does Congresswoman Del Bene, who is his colleague, a Democrat colleague. She's on the Ways and Means Committee um, with Chairman Neal to mark up the bill and get it going. Um, to the floor. And the reason why this is so important is that um, there's a group of health care policies that are called the extenders because they have to be extended every so often. It includes community health center funding, the Medicaid, CHIP money, some special diabetes money. And so those are all expiring on November 30th. And so there will be an, an, a health care bill on or around November 30th, and we would like this prior authorization bill to get on that train. And so the Ways and Means Committee needs to uh, get it through the committee so that it can get on that train. And then either it will get accepted all the way through without the Senate ever having to do a bill, or the Senate will quickly do a bill so that we can have a match. But we subsequently did a, a call with the rest of the medical societies that have political action committees with Chairman Neal, and we brought up this piece of legislation to him. He was very familiar with it. He um, said that he reiterated his commitment to Congresswoman Del Bene and Congressman Barra. So I feel like um, if we can uh, get moving with the leadership, which I don't think um, has, they don't have opposition to this, um, then hopefully in this November package after the election, this will get done. And we will at least for Medicare Advantage, which would be good for vascular surgeons, hopefully given the age, et cetera, of the patient population, um, That'll be a good first start, and if it goes well, I think commercial insurance will see the value in regards to their costs of having to run all these prior authorizations. So, Absolutely. Um, so we're and moving ahead. You know, everybody's feeling the bite of the this LCD um, that came into force for a lot of people July 1st, and I'm sure Dr. Monahan's incredibly familiar with this, um, you know, because uh, coding and reimbursement have been working on it. Um, essentially from the get-go, you know, since the latter part of last year. Uh, and again, that ends up, it is a priority going forward, primarily working with CMS. Um, and this is where they're requiring essentially, which is almost unprecedented in Medi the Medicare population prior off for venous procedures. So uh, SVS is also advocating hard on that front and, and trying to nip that one in the bud. So, um, on well, that one, to write letters. You need somebody to write letters and help out. Sign me up. I'll give you a hand. Absolutely. Great. I think this is a great opportunity for uh, partnering with our, um, you know, Venus Forum partners and making sure that you know we're we're marching hand in hand on this one. And obviously, uh, we remain hand in hand with um, PAC Steering Committee uh, as the leadership baton is passed. So uh, thank you for that as well, because it sounds like that's coming out of the gates very quickly after a really terrific, uh, a really terrific couple of years uh, under Dr. Dalsing's leadership. So I would say just for starters, I would urge anyone who has not given to the PAC, give to the PAC. It doesn't necessarily have to be a lot, but it is a message uh, in addition to resources and use voter voice not only for the impact of it, but so you understand how it works. Uh, and what I think in terms of our learning as we go about the impact of your actions, ask your partners and your friends personally, just send an email and the link to the voter voice, for instance, or to the PAC. Um, Yazan Duari, just to give an example, sent uh, an email out to his mega group at Emory. And I think that they ultimately were about 10% of the entire response, initial response to the voter voice this last go round. Um, so just a little nudge for folks who haven't necessarily traditionally been engaged, and it's so darn easy. Um, I would encourage you all to do that, and this is one of those things that kind of picks up momentum as it goes. 
and I, and I'd second that. I you know I started as the sole portion of my department doing it, and I got so far twelve of my eighteen to do it. Um, you know, once I got a few shaming the rest, uh, you know, we gained a little momentum. I haven't got a hundred percent, but you know, the more people that uh, respond, the more impact it has on our congressional leaders. It's absolutely fantastic, and I'll tell you, within a practice, if people look left and look right and everybody in the practice is doing it, and it kind of becomes a little bit of an expectation, or at least the norm, uh, that is gonna be incredibly, incredibly meaningful us, to us going forward. So thank you for that. And uh, I'd ask everybody to try to do the same. Any other parting thoughts? Mo, Jill? Excellent. No, no, well, thanks thank so. you thanks. Yeah, thank yeah, you all thank you everyone. for taking a chunk of your evening to join us. Um, the agenda should contain some good links. We'll try to put everything that's in the zip file somewhere on the advocacy site. And I think as a lot of things went up there in a giant hurry during the early part of COVID, there's also an opportunity to take a deep breath and update the website and kind of how those things are indexed for easy navigation. So please provide your feedback. Is Angela Taylor at SBS our point person on that? Mo? Uh, yes. Yeah. But I mean, I Excellent. could, I could relay any messages. Yeah. So yeah. let Mo know, you know, and, you know, or, or Angela, but I think Mo is, Mo is our staff for this committee and is doing an absolutely wonderful job uh, where you see opportunities, you find terrific materials that should be on there, but are not, um, or things that look out of date. Let's keep that, uh, let's keep that current and groomed. So thank you for your help in that. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thank you again very much. And I look forward to a terrific year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You, Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it.